So this session is called Dev 202, and uh, you can get a copy of the slide deck. I'm going to say sometime. I was going to upload it and give it to you just right now, but my internet doesn't work right now. So uh, I couldn't upload it right now. So the guy just went off with a, sl with a flash disk, and he's going to try to put it up there. Um, so keep checking there, tinyurl slash evodev202, and you should be able to pick up this deck. Lots of good information inside of here. Um, my name's Todd Bleeker. I've been doing SharePoint since before it was called SharePoint. I worked with SharePoint back when it was called Office Web Components, and I needed to place a pivot table onto an HTML page. Yes, that's pre-ASP Classic. So way back then, we could just do this optional install back on the front page CD, and we needed to be able to get data where people could have access to it. Data access, right? Actually, if you go way, way back, I did my thesis in my, uh, in my postgraduate work on how do you provide information to people when we have this voluminous volume of data that people need to be able to somehow glean through and how can you get them that access that they need so that they don't have to plow through so much information. Instead, they can just pick up the little bit that they're looking for to make that decision they're trying to make today. right? And I, I really focused in on um, expert systems, which were really important back then, and the idea that exception reporting was really the way people needed to go. Rather than trying to understand the entire uh, you know, mass of information to drill down. And really, things haven't changed that much, have they? Right? We've got a ton of information that people need to have access to, and some of it is stored in SharePoint. How do you get it out of there? Right? What, what, what do we even collect data for? Right? Why do people put stuff in systems? Because they want to get it out. Right? They want to somehow decide that they don't want to see the whole collection of information. Instead, they want to pull some of it out and do something with it. Right? So I'm going to cover the, the various kinds of technologies that we have available to us in SharePoint to get access to the data that's in SharePoint. All right? I'm going to talk about four different kinds. The first kind I'm going to talk about is the data access technologies I'm not going to talk about. <laughs> and I'll just briefly mention those. I'll talk about the deprecated technologies that are there and you can still use today, even in 2013, but you probably shouldn't. But I'll explain to you what they do do well and how we don't really have replacements for some of that. I'll talk about the server-side technologies that we have for getting data out of SharePoint. I'll talk about some of the client technologies that we now have to get data out of SharePoint. And then I'll analyze the various pieces, right? As I go along, I kind of like to take a little bit of a poll. I kind of like to know a little bit about how many people have used various technologies. So as I encounter the next technology and the next technology, I'm going to ask, how many of you have used it, right? That kind of a question. So all you got to do is throw your hand up for just a couple of seconds, and I'll step out of the light so I can see you. Um, so that I kind of have an idea of how many people have already encountered and understand the technology I'm talking about. All right, so let, first let me just talk about a couple of excluded things. Now, it is possible for us to get data and present it in SharePoint from other contexts, including SharePoint, using the, uh, the data sources in SharePoint Designer. I'm not going to be talking about that. I'm not talking about linked data sources. I'm not try talking about how I can go and get some data out of a SharePoint list and bring it over and show it in another site or something like that. I'm not talking about going out to some kind of a web service that's outside of SharePoint, right? Or some kind of an RSS feed or some kind of an endpoint where I can get XML. I'm not talking about that. I'm, talk I'm not talking about getting data outside of SharePoint presented inside of SharePoint. That's oftentimes what we talk about, right? dashboarding stuff and making it so it all looks like it's in SharePoint. That's not the conversation today. But I am curious to know how many of you have used data sources in SharePoint Designer, just so I can kind of see. About half of you, maybe a little bit more than half. Okay, that's nice. I'm also not talking about BCS. Once again, BCS is about getting information from someplace else and presenting it as if it lives in SharePoint, either as a virtual list right, or as an external column or if you've got SharePoint Server as search results, a profile page, or something in an Office client. Those are really simplistic ways of, of sort of explaining those technologies, but I'm not going to talk about BCS because it's about getting data so that it looks like it's in SharePoint. Yes, you could build a BCS that you would point to a SharePoint source and pull data out of SharePoint to present in SharePoint, but that probably isn't done very often, so I'm not going to consider that as one of the technologies we're going to use. That said, how many of you have used BCS to get information? Wow, more like 80% uh, of you, very good. Okay, that's awesome. All right, so those are the excluded ones. Let me talk a little bit about the deprecated technologies, the things that were 
not supposed to use anymore. So now way, way back in SharePoint 2001, when I used to uh, manage an offshore team in New Delhi, India, we needed to be able to share business requirements back and forth, tasks that people had to complete. Right? We wanted to actually have a way of assigning things to people, to-dos, right? to make sure that everything got accomplished for the, for the clients that those people were working for across the globe. And so SharePoint Team Services made a lot of sense. Back in those days, to get data out of SharePoint, all we had was the browser-based interface, a few components, and URL protocol. We had something called front page RPCs and SharePoint RPCs, and basically, these were the precursor to what we now know of as REST, right? The idea that I could do query by URL. Now, it wasn't as refined as REST. It didn't have anywhere near the, the uh, sort of sophistication with regard to filtering and uh, the ability for us to, um, uh, to, to sort of build a RESTful uh, request that would work in any system, right? That there wasn't a consistency or some kind of a laid out idea of how we would get at stuff. But it was really cool that I could use a URL from a JavaScript context and pull data out of SharePoint and do whatever I wanted with it. So the URL protocol was something I used quite a bit back in the day. It was really a powerful way for me to get information, including the schema of my SharePoint lists, directly from SharePoint itself, just using the URL. Um, I always kind of think about, uh, oh, look at that. I, I finally got connected to the guy who was saying, hey. <laughs> You should have network connectivity. I didn't all that time. Um, all right, so the URL protocol is still there. You can still call it, but it had some problems, and I'll explain those momentarily. We also have web services. Web services, Ask the Next Web Services. They came along in SharePoint 2003 and then were supplemented in 2007, right? And those web services are still there, and we can still make calls into them, and sometimes that makes sense. And then finally, we have sandbox solutions. And that's not really quite the same fit, but I wanted to make sure I covered the idea of how sandbox solutions fit into this entire data access talk, right? So first, URL protocol. Now, this is legacy, query by URL. I always like to say REST is query by URL, answer by XML, right? The idea that I can go up and ask some kind of system for information, and it'll return it back to me. And then I can use the header of my request to determine whether I want to insert something, update something, or delete something as well. So I can do the full uh, the CRUD query capabilities, right? So this didn't have quite that much oomph, <laughs> right? There were a few select things I could do that were defined as commands, CMD. And those commands were possible for me to go and get something out or update some things, upload a file even. I could do several things with this technology, but it had a big problem. Every request went through a DLL called OWS SVR, Office Web Services Server, I guess. Uh, that OWS SVR had a problem because every time you would go and put something through that, the URL was virtually the same. And so what happened is that things that did audit logging, um, anything that wanted to track what was happening on your SharePoint site couldn't, right? Because it was a, it was a generic place for us to go through. Um, however, it had some really interesting response formats. Some of these are very difficult for us to even yet to create today. Like if I want to export something in an Excel format, in an ICS format, or in a VCF format, I usually look to the URL protocol because this natively knows how to export those very useful outputs. Right, so if I've got a contact list and I want to give somebody a VCF, or if I've got a calendar and I want to give somebody an, a schedulable event that they can just click on, I still look to the URL protocol to do those things. Now, I don't know what the replacement is. Anybody know of a replacement for these? How else can you output those file formats besides the URL protocol? Anybody? So I'm, aware, I'm unaware of any way to do this other than to roll it yourself. Right, so if you roll the technology yourself, you could obviously export uh, in whatever format you'd like. But this is just a built-in capability right in the system today. So why might you use the URL protocol today, even though it's deprecated? Because I want to output one of these file formats. Now, you always have to trade something off, right? If it's deprecated, what does that mean? You write it today, and tomorrow it may not be there. Okay, but 
if it gets done today, you might have more time to write it the way you want to write it in the future, right? Because this is a freebie. I call it up, it gives me this file format. I don't have to write anything now. Okay, so it may be worth going ahead and leveraging it today, even though tomorrow it may not be there, because guess what? The version 2 of SharePoint introduced web, part, web parts that were delivered by SharePoint, SharePoint web parts. Guess what? JavaScript web part framework is still behind SharePoint 2013. Even though SharePoint web parts have been deprecated since 2007, we still have the underlying WPSC, the web part pages services component, right? I actually asked the product team about this. I said, well, how can we still have the WPSC if we're all supposed to be using ASP.NET web parts now? And they said, well, is it still there? <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And not only that, I can call into it, but there's a couple broken pieces. And they said, oh, well, we're just not going to do anything with it. So they don't know. They don't have anybody on the team who knows what that thing was, but they don't want to yank it, right, because they don't know what might break. They still have some SharePoint web parts in there. So just because it's deprecated doesn't mean it's necessarily going away. And if I need to output one of these guys, I might just go ahead and do it, right? I might just go ahead and leverage this technology. I'm not recommending you use deprecated technologies. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just saying if I need something out of there today, boom, I've got it with just calling a URL, all right? So that's a nice thing. However, URL protocols also have some issues, right? First thing is that you have to have permissive browser file handling on your web application. Now, in SharePoint 2007, it wasn't a problem because everything was permissive. It wasn't until SharePoint 2010 that they added to the web application this thing strict or permissive. But if you don't have permissive set or you don't go in and explicitly say that these are the file formats that you can get out, the user will be prompted with a save dialog. Wait a second, let's go back. Is that okay? For these file formats, a save, a save dialog may just be fine, right? If I'm going to give them an ICS file, here's your save dialog. Go ahead and save it, and then you can double click on it and, or open it right there, right? So you can open it right up, and it'll just connect right, right out to Outlook. So that may not be a horrible thing, but I'm just saying if you want to use this so that they see the XML in your JavaScript or something like that, <laughs> you're going to have to have permissive set. Or otherwise, they're going to be asked to save the XML to a, the file system before you can even consume it. All right. Second thing is that, of course, I already mentioned audit logs all point to this one DLL. So it's like everybody's doing everything through one endpoint. And it doesn't make any sense. The new endpoints, right, the, uh, the underscore API or the old underscore VTI underscore bin uh, for the web services and for the WCF services like client.svc and so forth, the audit logs understand what those are because they wrote special rules to say, oh, this is what's happening there. But the old OWS SVR is not like that. So if you start using that a lot, you're, gonna, you're not going to be auditing that information very well. Uh, a, a third thing that's really problematic is that you have to use a GUID of the list. So working in dev and then working in test and then working in prod is problematic because you don't know what the GUID is going to be where your destination is. So you kind of have to do some, maybe some mixing and matching. Maybe I'm going to use some CSOM or some JSOM to go get the GUID and then call out to this guy so I can get my file format out. So it's, it's way easier to get the GUID today than it was in 2001, I guarantee you. <laughs> Getting the GUID was like hard coding back in those days. We have one list, and that's the one we wrote our code for, right? The one in production. Uh, another problem is that JSON is not a valid output. You get XML or one of those file formats, right? You don't get JSON, the JavaScript object notation, so you can't just do an eval on that and have an object that you can work with. So you're working with XML in JavaScript, and that might be problematic, right? Because it's not as easy to work with as JSON. Doesn't mean that you can't still use the XML. Doesn't mean that it's not you know, doable. It's just more challenging. Uh, there's tools for us to manage with JSON, right? The JavaScript object notation. Um, whereas uh, with XML, we kind of got to roll it ourselves. Especially when we're in a, JavaScript for, for, uh, in a JavaScript context, that might be challenging. And then lastly, there are some caching issues, and I doubt it's been tested for years, right? But if you're going through a browser-based technology and it's getting cached up and things are changing and you're getting the old data, that might be problematic, right? So you have to weigh all of those cons, if you will. URL protocol, though, isn't necessarily dead if you want one of those file formats. In my opinion, I doubt Microsoft is ever going to really address this. They're just going to let it drift. And if it doesn't work anymore, they're not going to fix it, but they're probably not going to strip it out. That'd be, my, that'd be my suspicion. But who knows? I've seen them actually delete images that they weren't using anymore. 
And I'm like, why did you get rid of the image? I was, I was leveraging that image. Well, there's no guarantee that the images will be there from one release to the next. Okay, so there's no guarantee that this OWS SVR.dll is going to be there next release, right? They've, they've given us fair warning. It's maybe going away. All right, that's, that's a URL protocol. Second one is SMX Web Services. Now, some of you might be going, wait a minute, I use a lot of these, right? Because back in 2003 and 2007, this was all we had, right? This was our only way, right, of getting at SharePoint data from afar. Anybody here use list.com? ASMX. Yeah, look at that. Look around. 80% of you, maybe more, right? Because that was our only way of getting in there and getting at that information. We didn't have another choice. However, anybody here ever rolled your own soap header? Brave soul, brave soul, right? Holy cow, those things are unnecessarily complex, wouldn't you agree? And not only that, but when you get your data back, ever try to understand that XML? You know what that really is, don't you? They took a data set and they serialized it. They're just returning a data set that becomes XML as part of the serialization process. That's why the stupid things start with all the goofy names that they do, right? And spaces are interjected so oddly and so forth. I'll get to that momentarily. All right, so how do we get to the web services? Well, we go to underscore VTI underscore bin, right, in the web service name. And then we have to actually post it, uh, send it a SOAP envelope. We can't actually sort of test it in the browser. You can get to the browser and you can see all the methods and you can even see the SOAP header you need to create, but you really can't test it there, right? You have to write a harness of some kind. Now you can call it from jQuery, right? You could call it directly from JavaScript. You could call it from a managed code context and grab onto the service document, the WSDL. You know what, I didn't even include this on the next thing, but Help me remember service virtualization, okay, on the next slide. Um, it is accessible from all of those locations, right? However, the request headers that you have to create are quite complex. Now, it's way easier in, J in jQuery than it was back in the day when we had to hand roll the whole thing, right? I remember using a CSS behavior in order to call web services to get back the stuff so that the, the, the behavior took care of a lot of that SOAP programming. And then the response formats are XML only. Again, we don't get JSON, right? So we can't work with modern tools to make this go. Not only that, but when's the last time they added new functionality to the web services? I'm talking about ASMX web services now. In fact, are the web services even complete? So let me flip to the next page. There's what I call weak API coverage. How in the world did those web services get there anyway? Anybody know? Why are the web services there that are there? Because Office needed them. That's why. They didn't write them for you. They wrote them so that Office could get into SharePoint. So if Office, if Office happened to need the same thing that you needed, then it's there. If they didn't, it's not. And you get to write your own. Anybody here ever roll your own SMX web service for SharePoint? Wow, you guys are a good crowd. That's about 50% of you. Service virtualization, I don't have it on the slide up there, but that was the idea that if I'm in a sub-web down deep in the URL and I want to maintain that context, I have to create two ASPX pages that represent the disco and the WSDL that would otherwise be dynamically generated. But because SharePoint has a virtual path provider, we have to manage that which means that every time I change the footprint or the signature of my web service, I also have to change the WSDL and the Disco ASPX simulators so that they get delivered properly as well. Otherwise, my web service won't work in an underlying child site. It'll only work in a top-level site. Uh, of course, again, JSON is not, is not a valid response. We have, again, complex request headers. Now, some people say, Hey, Todd, you, haven't you heard of this SP services that Mark Anderson wrote? Man, all you got to do is go grab that thing, throw in a little Ajax thing, boom, boom, bam. He does all that stuff but behind you, so you don't have to do it, right? It's already been done for you. It's slick as snot. You're like, yeah, okay, that's true. But they're still deprecated, right? They're still going away, or at least they're not improving, and they're not complete. Not only that, but the responses suck, too. Right, they start with OWS underscore for in front of everything. Think of the wasted bandwidth <laughs> uh, all by itself, right? Four letters for every single, every object that ever came back, right? Um, not only that, but 
it doesn't handle spaces in the names of things. And it's, I believe it's case sensitive too. I don't even think I've got that up there, right? But the whole thing is just quite, quite challenging that way. All right, so Asimax Web Services. There's a lot of strikes there too. Uh, not, the least of which is that it's deprecated, right? Okay, the third one really doesn't fit into this entire talk, but I, I can't not say sandbox solutions are going away, right? And so sandbox solutions are a way that we could get data out of SharePoint and do something with it. It was the first attempt that Microsoft made to satisfy the demands of Office 365. The idea that I got to deliver some code up to a server, but nobody's going to install it for me. Right, so how many of you worked with Sandbox Solutions? Just let me kind of see your hands. Again, wow, about half of you. Experienced crowd, that's excellent. The server object model running in the context of the client data, or the contact, content database. Um, they basically put the DLL into a cab file with a WSP extension, uploaded it into the content database, and then at runtime, they extract it out and put it in a special place on the file system where they then reflect on it and load it so that they can run it in the SharePoint context. That's really cool. Quite an achievement. In fact, this was the next best thing. Remember three years ago at the SharePoint conference, it was like, never build another farm solution. Sandbox solutions are everything you're ever going to need. What did they just say like six months ago? Never build another farm solution or a sandbox solution, right? Apps for SharePoint is everything you're ever going to need. I'm pretty sure I heard that before somewhere. So they were created in 2010 and deprecated in 2013. They were an ill-conceived idea. Why? Well, if you were here in Ted's talk, right, just the previous talk, he kind of enumerated many of the reasons. They're still there, and at least in theory, they still work from a backward compatibility perspective. But I can tell you, I teach a dev class, week-long dev class, and in my core class, I may have six sandbox solutions that we build, and five of them don't work in SharePoint 2013. Um, I don't think it was well tested. I think they just went, well, we didn't change anything, so it must still work. Um, and I'm just not as compelled that that's true. I believe what happened is that the way that they authenticate changed so radically that sandbox solutions sometimes just don't know what their context is. So if you're doing anything at all that requires a security context, it might be problematic. Okay, so they say it's backward compatible. I'm not so sure. Uh, I actually started a thread with the product team to say, hey, here's the problems I'm having. And they were all excited to hear my problems, but I haven't had time to report them. Right? But there are some problems, in my opinion, with Sandbox Solutions in 2013. All right, so why didn't they fly? Why didn't people go, yeah? First of all, they were way too limiting, right? And they took way too much effort. Anybody think apps for SharePoint are way too much effort? Anybody? Come on, get your hands up, crying out loud. We go from four lines to over 10. Four lines to over 10, right? Because what did we used to do? We used to go from the browser to the SharePoint server, maybe to some kind of authentication provider, back to the SharePoint server, and then back to the browser. That's four lines, right? And I can tell you that no matter what kind of app for SharePoint you're building, you're probably exceeding 10 lines from the browser to the SharePoint server to the identity provider, back to SharePoint, out to your app, back to SharePoint, out to your app, back to SharePoint, out to your app, through SharePoint, back to the client. And I didn't even talk about how your app has to talk to the identity provider at times. There's a lot of lines. If you don't know how to use Fiddler, <laughs> then you better go do some reading. I don't even have that on my deck, but that's another one that's coming for sure. All right, so uh, far too limiting and way too much effort. Managed code loaded by SharePoint does not have an ASP.NET context, which means we don't have access to server-side resources. We're not running on the page. We're running in some process someplace else. So we couldn't get to other web parts. We couldn't get to other page resources. We couldn't get to the file system. We couldn't get to anything that was in the context of the actual running page because we were running someplace else, which meant we had no page or control code behind, which meant we couldn't run in an elevated way, right, because it was sandboxed. So you couldn't actually get the permissions that you needed to do something if the user didn't have them directly. And of course, you can't send any email. And we all know that with the uh, oncoming ESN that that won't matter at all, right? The enterprise social networks are going to take over and nobody's going to use email ever again. That's what I've been told. Lots of stuff 
wrong with Sandbox Solutions that caused us not to be able to solve the problem we were trying to solve, which is deploy code to a server, right, without the administrators getting involved in changing the underlying infrastructure. So they had to come up with something else. All right, so that's my deprecated talk. Deprecated solutions are something you should avoid, and I'll, re I'll re-summarize that at the end. So server-side technologies. Server-side technologies are still tremendously viable. However, you'll be writing less and less of them, in my opinion. Um, server object model still has its place. You'll see in a moment how many things you just can't do without it. Uh, link to objects and link to SharePoint. And then finally, WCF services. Those are the three that we're going to talk about. Uh, anybody think of any other server-side technology that will let you get data out that I haven't mentioned? I'm going to, yeah, that's client-side, though. I mean, it can be server-side as well, but he said CSOM. And that's true, you can't do it there, too. Any other server-side technology? You can't go directly after the file system, right? You could go directly after the database, but we're not going to talk about those because, hello, <laughs> those are totally not appropriate, right? Um, so I suppose there's other ways you could get in there, but I'm going to talk about these three sort of supported mechanisms, something you might continue to do on into the future. So first, the server object model. Powerful, mature, robust. I remember back in 2001, we had nothing, right? It was all comm components. And it was truly, they, they put out an ASP extension, but it was truly just an HTM page, right? It wasn't even ASP Classic, right? And along came 2003, and they radically redid the entire back end. And one of the things they committed to was, we've created an object model, an API, if you will, application programming interface, right, that lets developers write code today that will work 10 years from now. And it's 2013. That is 10 years. And code I wrote in 2003 still runs, unless it was based on some of the things that they radically overhauled, right, like security, when we only had two securable objects and now we have four, right, so they redid some of that stuff. But 95% of the API that they wrote in 2003 is still functional today. And if you wrote components back then, yeah, Ted's right. You still have to recompile it to get it to run in the new stuff. But it runs because they were pretty serious when they said we're committed to this object model being consistent from one release to another. Very good, actually. It provides for elevated code execution. When Ted was talking on the previous talk, he said, um, <laughs> how many of you run an elevated? How many? I did too, obviously, yeah. That's how you got stuff done, right? The business user can't do it. We're not going to give them permission to do it. Who better to do it than my code? Yeah, and I actually think that there's a place for that. And we'll see that you, you can't get rid of ele elevated permissions, right? That that's a necessity. However, <laughs> it can cause some let's just say angst on the server side. Because we have server side capabilities, we can do things like link to SharePoint and link to objects. Now I include, I include link to objects because SharePoint has a bunch of collections and you can use link to objects against SharePoint's collections. Okay, so that's why it's related to SharePoint. Those two technologies give me an, an easy way to write compiled code that's tested at design time rather than tested at run time. And I get IntelliSense and really elegant ways of querying information no matter where it lives in a consistent way. Link is a beautiful language, unless you've enabled your business users to change the data, uh, uh, the, the data store, right? So you can say, hey, business users, go ahead and delete that column. I don't mind, right? Go ahead and rename the actual name I gave it to something else so I can't find it. So as soon as you start changing up the underlying data store, how do you write code against it, right? That's a link to SharePoint is great as long as the announcements list still looks like an announcements list, right? As soon as they decide they're going to delete off a field, we're in trouble. So you better have adopted content types and implemented static columns and said users cannot change the underlying schema of my data or I can't rely on my code to do the right thing. Now, truth be told, that doesn't matter what technology you use, it's going to be a problem. But it's super evident with Link, right? Because with Link, we establish this is our model. And if that model isn't there, just like if you're querying against the database, right, it isn't going to work. It's going to fail and fail catastrophically. So while these technologies are fabulous, in a SharePoint context, they may not provide the best um, sort of uh, uh, 
insurance that my code is going to run. Still, the server object model is the only way to go if you want to implement an imperative feature receiver, right? That is, if you're going to run custom code on a farm, a web application, or a site collection. Because apps for SharePoint can only run code on another server at a web level, right? And while you can kind of do some stuff at a site collection level or a collection of site collections as a tenancy, for the most part, you get a web level. That's pretty much where you're living. In fact, Microsoft's push toward it's just a web and nothing else. A web plus an app web, if you have an app, right, is, is so strong that they've eliminated the global breadcrumb and the local breadcrumb, right, in any kind of sort of notion of this is sort of hierarchically related to everything else. So if you haven't been in SharePoint 2013 and tried to find your parent site yet, you're in trouble, Right, because you go down to a child site, then there's no way to get back up except to edit the URL. And you're like, wow, my users are going to hate this. The expectation is that, no, they won't. They're going to have a my site. And they're going to have either created the site, and therefore it's automatically followed, or they're going to care about the site, and they're going to follow it. So all of their followed sites are going to be on their my site. They're going to go from their my site down to wherever they want to see, back up to their my site, and then down to wherever they need to go. And it's not going to matter where those sites are related to each other, Right? They're going to go from their my site. That's the, that's the theory. So if you want to do uh, imperative logic at the higher levels, an enterprise kind of a view of things, you need full control. Right? You need a server object model. Uh, if you want to extend PowerShell, you can read them. If you want to implement a brand, right? push out a master page to all of the sites in a given context. If you want to create web parts, yes, I know there's app parts. Right? And app parts have their place, and they're pretty cool, right? but they're not a web part. So if you want to do what a web part could do, including elevation of privilege, right? you're going to need a server-side object model. Um, if you want to create custom sitemaps, timer jobs. How many of you have worked with timer jobs? You want them to go away? <laughs> right. So server object model is not going away anytime soon. Check out these other things you can do. Membership providers, role providers, claims providers. The idea that I want to have an embedded WCF service with an auto-generated MEX endpoint. Wow, that's cool. I really love that. But then my WCF service is living in SharePoint. They want to get away from that, right? They want you to put your WCF service where? On some other server that you don't have any deployment mechanism to get it there, right? That you don't really have any, any way of managing it because it's not in SharePoint. It's not in the WSP. It's pre-deployed some other time, some other place. Unless, of course, you rent SharePoint from Microsoft. Then you can auto-deploy it into their Azure Web Services and have your client pay for each time they use it. Um, so an embedded WCF service requires client side or server side object model, custom field types, custom list definitions, right? A lot of the BI solutions are going to require some kind of server side footprint. So on premise isn't going away. However, you'll see that's what Microsoft would like, right? They would like for it to go away. They won't tell you that. They'll tell you, oh no, no, no we'll support you for for as long as we can, you know, we can possibly do it because they know how important it is to many of us. And I'm not even trying to say don't take a serious look at Office 365. I think there's really good reasons to move to the cloud. There's some really compelling reasons to go there. But sometimes you just can't. You can't run a timer job in the cloud right now. Right? You just can't do it. can't run a custom field type in the cloud. Those things are not accommodated as of yet. So that's the reasons that we should be using a server object model. What are the problems? Well, you have to run on a SharePoint server. You can't deploy to Office 365. You can't deploy to any host. Right? If somebody said, hey, we're going to host SharePoint, they would say, but we can't take your DLLs. Unless you have a dedicated host. And then it's really just somebody being the operations team for your on-premises site. It may not be on-premise, maybe co-located, whatever, right? but it's not hosted. A hosted environment means that you can't put your custom code on their servers, right? They're just running SharePoint. They're not running any of your custom bits. Um, SharePoint is still very proprietary from an object model perspective. You go talk to some ASP.NET guy or some Java guy and say, hey, you're going to do a SharePoint project. They're going to be like, oh, I, I don't understand the whole context thing. And what is it with the object disposal anyway? And how can they call a site? a site collection and they call a web a site and what's the whole translation? I don't know how to do all of that. 
they're going to be confused, right? They're not going to understand the SharePointisms that we take for granted, that we can just go, oh, yeah, that's how it works. So it's a proprietary thing. Not only that, but I can't tell you how many times I teach my class and I have a student say, so how do I implement MVC on top of this thing? <laughs> yeah, well, SharePoint is kind of an MVC, right? So if you want to do an MVC, uh, then you're going to need an app for SharePoint because you've got to deploy it someplace else and then sort of consume it in that rectangle within SharePoint. Right? It's a different model. It's not going to be something that somebody who's accustomed to doing MVCs is going to be able to step in and, and, and take advantage of. They're not going to understand that model. Um, and unfortunately, it's become inconsistent over time. Have you noticed that on the tests, uh, on the exams for certification, they have a tendency to ask you the questions about stuff that doesn't match the consistent model? And it's like, wait a minute, why couldn't it have all been delete? Right? Update, add, so that they were all the same. I didn't have to remember, oh, it's add item in that one context. That's right. You know, so it's, it's become inconsistent. In 2003, man, the plan was great. Right? The architect who put together the database and the plan did a really good job of laying a solid foundation. I mean, bravo Zulu to that guy, right? But... Over time, a thousand people on a dev team, people, oh, I thought that's how it worked, right? So we've even seen some very visible things where the token names themselves aren't even correct, right? Because they don't match the consistent back-end naming convention that we're accustomed to. All right, object disposal. Anybody here ever had a server? Just go haywire and you know, start getting memory loss, right? Have your W3WP just go flipping out of, and you're like, what the heck? And it turns out that there's this one line in there that's in a for each loop that you didn't realize was supposed to be disposed of because it was the, you know, it was the parent object of the other object that had to have a web in it and it happened to hold on to a reference and that com component back in the back end of the iceberg didn't go away, but you didn't realize it wasn't going to go away and you get the idea, right? Especially for one of the server object models, like, I mean, the SharePoint server object model. That thing is just not as consistent, is it? So, dis object disposal can cause, cause a problem. Why? Because it's written in COM. 60% of it is still COM components, right? You have to explicitly say, go away. It won't get garbage collected unless somebody says, I'm not holding a reference to you anymore. We also have uh, the concept of my code is dependent upon the SharePoint DLL. So I have to run on the server, right? I can't take the SharePoint DLL as a runtime and go and do it someplace else. Right, I have to install SharePoint and it has to be a member of the server in order for it to participate in the farm or the very first line of code, sbfarm.local, is going to fail. Right? Because the server object model is dependent upon my code running on a server in the farm. And then oftentimes we have to have full trust. If I went back and looked at all of the things that we just listed that you still have to do in the server object model, most of them require full trust. Why? Because they have to wake up and start running even if there's not an HTTP context. Right? It's got to be in the GAC where it's universally accessible or it won't work. All right, that's my server-side talk. So we're going to come back and we're going to review on a summary and analysis of those things. Right? But the, the server object model is an important aspect of what we still have to do. We're not going to be able to just cut it out immediately. But we need to start making a gradual transition to this new, brave new world called the client side, the dark side. Use the force, Luke. Right. So these are relatively new and somewhat immature, and so they have spotty coverage. But it's grown tremendously in this last release. Right? We went from a very small footprint to a very big footprint. However, every time I've gone in and tried to do something of consequence, guess what? I'm missing those two or three calls that I need to do, or it won't work. And it's like, what am I supposed to do, right? Fortunately, they're still working on it. And they're going to be making incremental changes. Their, their goal is to actually release new, new updates every eight weeks. That's their new agile uh, deployment model. Every eight weeks, they're going to try to roll out some, this is Yammer's influence on SharePoint. Did you know Yammer actually rolls out changes twice a week to their production environment? Twice a week, they roll out new stuff. Uh, I'm... Uh, I'm not sure about you, but how many of your IT pros are going to put updates every eight weeks onto your SharePoint implementation? So that means that you're going to have 
on premises and Office 365, and they're not going to be the same, which means that your code has to know which one it's running in and then has to make a decision about whether what you're trying to use is ubiquitously available in both or if I have to check to see if it's now available in the environment that I'm in. Uh, one of the big questions that we keep asking is uh, SharePoint uh, dependencies. How do we know which ones have been installed, what version we're at? Like, what version of workflow is available to me from SharePoint so that I know I can call into that one thing you added, you know, in service, in service pack one or even in one of the CUs. I don't know if you saw the March CU, but you have to install it. You don't have a choice. It's a CU. But if you don't install it, then you can't install future updates. Okay. So there's three different client object model technologies that I need to cover. And I need somebody to holler out, how much time do I have? I don't even know where I am. No clock. What's that? So, so I have 20 minutes? 20 minutes. Oh, boy. So just need client, client object model stuff. CSOM, JSOM, and REST. Some people call JSOM the JavaScript CSOM. I don't really like that name because JavaScript CSOM sounds hard to say. So CSOM, JSOM, and REST. Those are the three that I'm going to talk about. All right. First, client-side object model. Now, it was introduced in 2010. We could do client-side object model stuff. What is it? It kind of parrots the server object model. So if you know the server object model, then you probably kind of know the client object model. It's very similar. We have to get context. We have the same kind of basic objects. Just strip off the SP prefix, right? You can start working with the client object model. We get all three of the primary Microsoft platforms, right? Managed code, Silverlight, and scripted, right? So I can do this from a lot of places. The Microsoft platform is very well covered. We can even do this cross domain. I give it a full URL and I can go from this site over to some other site, right? Because they're literally making calls over to that client.svc over there to do whatever they need to do. It's implemented as a WCF service, so it's a great, a great endpoint story. Object disposal is built in. I, I'm going to make a call up to the server. It does all the right stuff. And then when it, when it leaves, it, it's a stateless protocol. So it clears everything out. I don't have to worry about the whole object disposal thing anymore. And it all runs synchronously. So when I make a call up, I wait. And when that call's finished, I get my response back. That may not be a pro, but that's how it works. All right. There are some issues with this as well. If you knew the server object model, the client object model seems like a, wow, that's a slam dunk, right? I get this. But if you didn't, and you're coming from some other context, uh, well, you still got to kind of know those SharePointisms, right? That add item, that, that weird sort of, oh, first you got to square bracket the thing and then put in a weak string, and then, and then you can get the object that you can actually manipulate with the properties. And it's not available on all Microsoft platforms. So you say, hey, I want to do the CSOM from Windows 8 Modern UI. You're like, why can't I do it from there? Well, because the runtimes don't actually work in that context. You can't really deploy that out with the, so you can't, yeah, you can't use that. OK, well, I want to do it from my PHP site. No, sorry, you really can't do it from there either. Well, you know, we got this Python thing over here. No, it's, it's ASP.NET, Silverlight, or JavaScript, right? At least you can do JavaScript from, oh, no, sorry. JavaScript has to be in a SharePoint context. So you really can't do JavaScript on your ASP.NET, or on your, uh, on your uh, I don't know, give me a name, PHP application, right? Oh, they always want to say LAMP, right? Anybody here ever written a LAMP application? One guy! So you know what it means and everything, huh? OK, so they always talk about LAMP. So let's do this on a LAMP stick and a post or something, and we can get it in there. Anyway, you can't do it there, right? Because the client-side object model is only available basically from a Microsoft platform. That's where we can get to it. And it's not available in a SharePoint hosted app either. Sorry, managed SharePoint hosted app. Why? Because SharePoint hosted apps can't have any managed code, right? Only client-side technology, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. That's it. No DLLs in a SharePoint hosted app because it's all in SharePoint. Right? We got rid of the DLLs on the server that's running on SharePoint. Remember, that was called a sandbox solution, and we said that was a bad thing. Right? So they said, no DLLs in a SharePoint hosted app. So you can't do it from there either. All right, that's CSOM. JSOM, the JavaScript object model that's the underlying CSOM right, for running from JavaScript. Again, it was introduced in 2010 and greatly enhanced 
in 2013, but not equally enhanced. You can do some stuff in CSOM that you can't do in JSOM, and you can do some stuff in JSOM that you can't do in CSOM. It kind of depended upon the team. There seems like there was a theme that said, if you can get it implemented on the client side in CSOM, do that first, and then try to do JSOM, and if you get that, then try to do REST, which I think was upside down. I think it should have been completely the opposite direction. If you can do it in REST, great. If you get that done, then do it in JSOM, great. Then do it in CSOM, because CSOM, in my opinion, should be the last one that they should be investing in. And you'll see why in a minute here. All right. So scripted implementation only, obviously, we're talking about JSON. That's JavaScript object model, script only. It's a SharePoint platform based. What do you mean I can't use this JavaScript in my ASP.NET application? True. Unless you use the cross domain library to call over to your app web and let your app web talk. Right, so if I have an app web, I can cause my JavaScript that's running on some other context to talk to my app web and have my app web actually do the work for me to talk to the host web and then come back, right? Because I can't talk directly cross domain through JavaScript. It's not allowed. Can't do it, right? You could sort of do the iframe thing, but that's what the cross domain library effectively does, right? They throw up a, a temporary hidden iframe where they do communication directly through the app web to the host web and back and then take the DOM and strip it out. You don't have to do any of that work. That's all done for you, right? It's just a, a library that you can just say, I want to reference that. But that's an important part, right? That I, I can only get to the JSON if I'm in the context of SharePoint, the app web or running right on SharePoint itself, right? Which is the app web. So if my JavaScript's not running in the app web, I really can't do this. Okay, and object disposal is built in. That's a nice pro. And it's asynchronous only. Wait a minute, Todd. I thought you said that the CSOM was synchronous only. Right. So, but the JSOM is asynchronous only. Right. So you have to think different depending upon which object model you're using here. There are some issues here. We have limited JavaScript tooling. Anybody think the tooling in Visual Studio 2012 is adequate for JavaScript? It's pretty good, though, right? It's getting better. I can do some, look, I get IntelliSense, and, but if I put my JavaScript in a different folder, eh, no, nah, it's not really there, right? It's got to be in the same folder. And I can't use the underscore references automatically. I had to go type that in myself, right? It doesn't pick up all of the, the uh, JavaScript files that are already there in SharePoint that they know are there in layouts. They don't pick those up. I got to go reference them directly myself, blah, 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 right? There's a lot of tooling things that I think the team could do quickly to make JavaScript a, a much more sufficient way to go. We have complex authentication schemes. So I'm going to ask this question, even though you might get embarrassed, that's okay. I'm going to raise my hand too. Does anybody have a thorough understanding of the way that the authentication tokens in ACS and S2S work today? Thorough understanding. No? I'm getting there. <laughs> Right? But even the experts, I'm sitting around talking to people and they're going, oh, oh that, is that low trust or isn't low trust when you got to go to the ACS on the other side to get the token around? No, 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 I thought, I thought low trust was just the S2S. No, 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 that's not low trust. That's actually OAuth with a token that's different way of approaching it than ACS. Okay, so complex, complex scenarios. Not only that, but I'm going to ask another question um, and I'm going to raise my hand for this one. Um, how many of you feel like you are, I'm not going to raise my hand, how many of you feel like you're JavaScript experts? Right, you've been doing JavaScript so long that it's just the back of your hand, right? You understand closures, you understand namespaces, you understand how to use properties and methods, you totally get the idea of private methods and public methods or public and private members, right? Anybody? Right? You feel really comfortable with jQuery and with Node.js and with, what's the other one? Knockout JS and with single page applications and with all of those 15 other things that you need for tabs and for navigation and for dates and blah, 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 right? And I don't even know which one to pick. I don't even, I haven't even formed an opinion yet. You know, like, oh, well, I like this date one better. Well, I like this date one better. Well, uh, okay. It's kind of like, which one should I choose? So JavaScript, wow. I have to tell you that uh, for 20 years, my favorite language was SQL, SQL. Why? No more powerful language on the planet, right? Set-based processing, so much more powerful than procedural processing. Link is pretty cool too, right? But SQL, wow. Drop database, database name, go. Four words, power, right? We're talking about, man, 
What a language. I loved it. I, was, I actually sat on the beach and read Joe Selko's book, right? It was like, wow, I love this language. But I've switched because SQL's dead, right? Anybody writing SQL 10 years from now, they're doing legacy stuff, right? Because it's all about an object-oriented manipulation of something that does that SQL in the back end, right? We're not going to be dealing with SQL 10 years from now. That, that's going to be some kind of support job, right? So, but what language will we likely be working in? The most ubiquitous language on the planet. So I've shifted. JavaScript is now my favorite language. It will be. It has to be, right? <laughs> because it can run on every device, right? It can run on your phone and on your iPad, even though Flash can't, right? It can run on my laptop. It can run on the desktop. It can run on a server. It can run everywhere, everywhere you want to be, right? So JavaScript, don't overlook this. This is a powerful, powerful, powerful context. However, it's complex today. Right? Most of the time you have to handle the headers and the responses yourself. Sorry, you have to stringify stuff. Right? You get back that JSON thing, you have to run a command to actually make it workable. Right? You have to put the actual calls, the AJAX calls, to the HTTP headers. You have to add the accept headers for application in XML and application in JSON. Right? You have to actually add the bearer token if you're not going to use the cross-domain library Right? that you had to auto-generate from your managed code context into the JavaScript so you could use it in there. This is a non-trivial place to be working today. It is complicated, but it is the future. Right? This is how we're going to be doing stuff tomorrow. Um, there's no runtime, sorry. With JSON, you can't run outside of a SharePoint site. You have to have that app web, right? Or you can't get there from an ASP.NET site or from a modern UI. That's not 100% true. You can if you're willing to call in and get an access token, whether that's from ACS or S2S, use that access token embedded within JavaScript as a bearer for your requests directly to the service. Right? But most of us aren't going to go there. That's a, that's a complicated approach to doing it. And it can be quite chatty. Right? Go up to the server a thousand times when we used to go back up at one and get back our stuff. Right? So we have to be careful. If we don't design our applications well, we're going to end up with a chatty situation. REST, representational state transfer, should have been called query by URL, answer by XML. Right? And then everybody went, oh, I get it, right? It's just a bunch of parameters I'm going to pass along to get back the data I'm looking for. So I have this huge hierarchy of information, and I want this part out, or I want to update these things. So I can create a very complex URL, right, and send it up there, and I'll get my right result. It's also got huge industry momentum, right? Everything is getting a REST interface so that I can write, if I'm good at REST, I can talk to any application anywhere. Right? And it truly is cross-platform. I can do it from PHP or Java or LAMP or whatever, right? Because it's just a URL that I'm throwing out and getting back the stuff. As long as I've got the right token, either through a cross-domain library or through a, an actual bearer token, I can go out and get whatever I want. Um, it's the only approach supported in technologies like the Windows 8 Modern UI, right? Previously known as Metro. A metro-style tile or a metro-style app, you can only get there if you're using REST. It's either synchronous or asynchronous because it depends upon your language. Is it synchronous or asynchronous in its call up to actually get the information back? And you get it coded however you'd like. That's cool. However, today, <laughs> if you did REST in 2010, then you used what was called the listdata.svc. And if you went to Visual Studio and you said, I want to go ahead and register an endpoint to the list data at SVC, at first it would even just pick it up and go, oh, look, underscore VTI underscore bin slash list data at SVC is here. You didn't know that, but I discovered it. So here is a service document that is a proxy class that makes it look like it's a local method with local properties, and you can just start working with that object just like you would with any local object. The same kind of service document we've been using with WSDL and web services is available for REST requests in a managed code context. And you're like, yeah, until you move to 2013 and shift over to the underscore API. When you move to a underscore API, the client.svc, which is now the RESTful endpoint, does not yet have a service document. This is, in my opinion, the number one problem with data access technologies in SharePoint today. And I said so when I was out in Redmond.
right? <laughs> the woman that was running the feedback session kept saying, so is there a problem with blah, 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 whatever she came up with is like, yeah, you don't have a service document, right? Because if you had a service document, that wouldn't be a problem. Well, how about a problem with this over here? Yeah, you don't have a service document, <laughs> right? If underscore API gave me a service document, then it'd be a no-brainer. Manage code and rest, no problem, right? Because I would just say, hey, what can I do over there? And it would tell me, here's your methods, here's your properties, here's the actual parameters you need to pass, just work with it as if it's a local object. But that's not available, right? That underscore API does not give you a service document yet. Am I out of time? Uh, the headers can be quite complicated still, right? You have to handle them natively, both in a managed code context and in a scripted context. Usually it's just in a scripted context because we have that service document. But we don't have any of that today, right? No discovery, right? It's all just you have to know it's there and you have to know what you can call. And then you have to hand roll the requests, post, get, all that stuff, right? And then when it comes back, you have to take the response and sort of mash it up so that you can use it in that context. And the transition from list data to SVC where I do get a service document to underscore API is going to be a little choppy for a while, right? List data to SVC gives me this much information, underscore API gives me this much information, but no service document. So in the meantime, I'd suggest you do some kind of a little shim that says, well, I'm going to call into what it will be eventually, and that will turn around and do the stupid call, right? So that eventually when the real thing is there, underscore API does understand how to do stuff, well, then my code just works. That's what I would suggest. I hope they get this done soon. But who's going to have it? Office 365. What about you on-premise folks? Yeah, a year or two when the service pack comes out somewhere you know, along the way. I don't know when it is. I'm, I'm being a little specious here, right? But uh, <laughs> um, I want this now, right? This is an important uh, thing, otherwise I really can't push forward with REST like I'd like to. And it can also be very chatty, right? Every single little thing you got to do is another URL to do that thing, right? So it's a little tiny niggly request up to the server for every single piece of data, every single update. There's not really a lot of batching. You're like, oh yeah, you can do that e-tag with the numbers and do a batch thing and it's great. Okay, <laughs> go for it. Uh, it's quite complicated from my perspective. Um, I'm not sure I'm really ready for the whole batching of restful requests like they, they have it organized yet today. So here's my analysis. If you're in a JavaScript context, then you should use REST. It's by far the most easy to use. And then, if you can't do it in REST, then consider JSON. Or if you're in a JavaScript context, those are your two options. If you're in a managed code context, then consider using REST, right? And then consider using CSOM, and then finally consider using server object model, right? Server object model means that you can't deploy to a hosted service. Server object model is the only way to do certain things. So that's got to be an option, but it should be your third option, right? So look for a client access technology that's going to get you there and only move to the server object model when you must. So here's a little chart. If you want to take a picture of something, this would be the thing to look at. Okay, this is my overall summary. Basically, your JavaScript REST allows you to do stuff in every single type of app in SharePoint. SharePoint hosted app, right? Self-hosted, meaning um, whether it's provider hosted or auto hosted, and the modern UI. All three of them are ways that I can get to SharePoint using the JavaScript RESTful context. Um, if I decide I'm going to use the JSOM, the client side object model, number one, I have to understand that somebody's going to have to understand the proprietary ideas about how Microsoft put it together. Number two, um, I'm going to have to go through the cross domain libraries if I'm in a self hosted app, right? And number three, you can't run it in a modern UI because there's no runtime available for that environment, right? It's only available for the Microsoft platforms. Remember that? Uh, managed REST, that was the second thing to recommend, right? First thing was JavaScript REST. Second thing was managed REST. But, sorry, you can't do managed REST in a SharePoint app because, look, AAA, no server-side code allowed in a SharePoint hosted app. So none of the managed technologies are allowed in a SharePoint hosted app. How about in a self-hosted app, right? That's either a provider hosted or an auto-hosted app. Well, okay, you can do managed REST there, but you don't get a service document today. As soon as you do, that's number one, right? Between now and then, write a proxy, <laughs> because you don't want to move off of number one that will eventually be number one, right? 
But if you can't do it with REST, then you should do it with CSOM. So managed CSOM would be your second choice for provider-hosted or auto-hosted app. What about in a modern UI? Yeah, you could do, you could do uh, a managed REST request from there, right? That's probably your best option. Although I haven't tried that yet, so I don't know if there's truly a gotcha. I'm kind of just going off of hearsay as to what you can do in a modern UI app. All right, the last two that you can see, um, uh, managed server object model is not available in any of the app models. So you can't do server object model code in any of the apps. That means you're going to do a solution, right? Farm solution, not a sandbox solution. So this hopefully will help you to just sort of aggregate all of the information that I covered. Um, there are a couple of other things that I want you to know. Um, you should avoid, I don't know why that's white. There's a white, there's a, there's a, there's a blank screen in there. Um, avoid your deprecated technologies. Duh, right? Obviously, um, you don't want to write something in a deprecated technology today knowing that it might go away tomorrow unless you've got a good reason. Um, use REST if possible, even in 2010. Right? REST is available in 2010. Start making that direction. Start making that move today. Right? Don't wait until 2013 to do that. Anticipate that underscore API. Right? Create your own little proxy. I'm hoping somebody does it in CodePlex so I don't have to write it myself right? on a one-off kind of a deal. If you can't use REST, then use CSOM or JSOM. Right? And if you can't use that, then use the server object model. That sort of sums up the data access technology talk. Right? That use REST if you can. Otherwise, use CSOM, JSOM. Otherwise, use server object model. And I am the last person to tell you to move to Office 365. I am not a big fan, right? It's like uh, uh, telling me that I will benefit so much if I just put these shackles on and I pay for the, you know, for the uh, service of living on their servers. Um, I'm a guy that likes to take my old computer desktop, shove it under a desk, and say, that's my new web server, right? Because I don't need what's in the cloud today. But sometimes you do. And I can tell you that Office 365 is going to have the latest bits way sooner than your on-premise is going to have those bits. Their new model for rapid deployment is going to mandate that they deploy it out to Office 365 where they have control first. Then once they know that that's all working, we'll get to a service pack for you on-premise folks. That's not what they'll say. They're going to say, oh, no, no, you're our first class citizen. But think about it. Is that possible? Is it possible for them to make on-premise? the same as Office 365. I just don't think so. And I heard them talk about it, so I, I really feel confident that it's not. Eliminate sandbox solutions today if possible. There are some times when you must do a sandbox. You're in an Office 365 context. You're working for a government agency or something, right? You don't have a choice. And today, you have to write something that's not available in one of those other client-side technologies. You're in SharePoint 2010. It's not available. So what are you going to do? You have to write a sandbox solution. But if you don't have to, don't. Right? Don't do that today because you know that that is going away. And I can tell you that I feel the pain because it doesn't necessarily even work properly. If you need to do link, consider going and getting the SharePoint provider for LinkPad and auto-generating some camel because camel survives into the future. Link does not. Right? You can't do link to SharePoint in any of the client object model, but you can still do camel. Right? So get accustomed to camel. Don't miss these sessions. There's only three slides of sessions, then I get one more slide, okay? But I really wanted to highlight a couple of these things. The first one is AC is going to do a workflow where he talks about CSOM, right? And then in his single page application, he's going to actually talk about REST. And his entire thing is about REST tomorrow. Um, that's later today with the, with the workflow. I thought he would do a lot of REST in the workflow. It sounds like he's going to do a, a CSOM workflow. Um, Paul Schaefline is going to talk about application identity. I've been working with Paul for a very long time. Paul's excellent. And you have to understand identity. If there's one thing that you have to understand in this release of SharePoint, it's identity. If you don't understand how to wield those tokens about, if you don't understand the concept of claims and OAuth, you can't build apps. I mean, you can build a SharePoint hosted app where it doesn't matter, right? The identity's already been identified. But if you want to build apps for SharePoint that go into any kind of a marketplace, then you're going to have to understand what Paul's c covering. Um, don't miss REST with Eric, CSOM with me, right? And then OAuth with Ted. Those are three great sessions tomorrow that are going to give you the in-depth information that I couldn't cover in this talk, right? And then finally, um, TypeScript. TypeScript is an up-and-comer. 
right? This basically makes JavaScript work like you'd expect it to, right? It, it puts some, some boundaries on it and makes it look a lot more real, like a real language. Um, in addition, I, I hope Matt will talk about JS Lint and JS Hint, right? And the whole concept of strict development, use strict to make sure that your code isn't doing goofy stuff like global variables and stuff like that, right? Uh, and then lastly, uh, Paul Schaeflein is going to do another talk about the app model that I think will be really good near the end of the day, just before the Ask the Experts. So tomorrow, the analysis for tomorrow then, right? Understand OAuth. That's your first task. If you don't understand OAuth, you're not going to build an app, right? It's, it's a crucial thing to understand how authentication works. Second, learn REST. This is a future of application development, in my opinion, right? If you know REST, you'll be... You know, half decade, decade into the future, because that's where we're headed. Everybody's going to rest today. It's got market momentum. Thirdly, learn JavaScript. Seriously. I know. I know. I wrote a lot of JavaScript, and I wrote horrible JavaScript, right? But I'm getting there, right? Just take some time. Go through some tutorials, whatever you got to do. <laughs> learn JavaScript. I actually bought a little book, and I'm going through it with my son. He wants to learn web development. It's a little game JavaScript thing, right? But I'm going to learn JavaScript in that process, right? Some stuff I would never otherwise explore. Don't miss jQuery. If you're going to learn JavaScript, that's one side of the coin. jQuery is the other side. You've got to understand jQuery. You've got to understand the, the way that jQuery is extended and the way that jQuery plugins work. Why write all that code? Go get 15 libraries, throw them in there, and go, hey, this is how I call them. Right? This is my little bit of code. That's their big bit of code. It's all been tested. It's great, right? You saw Ted's uh, four tabs, right, all through a single-page application. Really cool. Don't miss TypeScript. I already talked about that. Don't miss single-page applications. AC is going to do a talk about that tomorrow, I believe. Learn MVC, right? MVC is something I had the luxury of ignoring for a decade. But now, if I'm going to build a SharePoint app, why would I build it as an ASP.NET form app? I'm going to adopt MVC. Man, I started playing with the model view controller thing. Wow, I'm like... I was really missing something here. No wonder they're all excited about it. This is pretty cool, right? And so I'm trying to pick that up, right? I got to brush up some of my skills that I haven't done. Learn HTML5, learn CSS3, right? There's a lot of stuff on our plate in order to really adopt this app for SharePoint thing. Learn WCF because that's the only way you can remote things. From workflow, from your app, if you're going to do an event receiver, you got to call it a WCF service, right? So that's a big bite. If you don't know WCF. Okay, that's my talk. Um, I'll be out in the hallway for a little bit, and, uh, um, and I'll cover questions when I'm out there. All right, so let me unplug and let somebody else get in here. All right. <laughs>